one. I'm going to go through a few things in this speech. Firstly, points of frame. Secondly, on why we get better social cohesion on our side, allowing society to move on from conflict. Secondly, on why we are more likely on our side to prevent backsliding into dictatorship or just weaker forms of democracy. Thirdly, the principal justification and necessity behind this. Firstly, in terms of framework, I think in terms of these states and the, the types of places that we are talking about this debate are new emerging democracies. It's very rare that dictators fall to other dictators or other tyrants. The reason for this is because the, most people uprise against dictators because they hate the limitations upon their ideology options, upon their free speech, upon all of their other rights. Therefore, the majority of times that dictators and tyrants fall and are post-conflict are when they are replaced by some form of democracy movement. So I think the majority instances we are talking about here is in those emerging democracies. Therefore, the trade-off that we are discussing in this debate is the, perhaps, limitation of some forms of free speech in debate, although I will go into that later as to why I think that is actually not happening here, versus ensuring that there is a stable democracy going forward for future generations. What is our model in this debate, given that it is, is it in this house with debate? Um, I'm not going to overly complicate this. The symbols that glorify or paint these dictators sympathetically in the public sphere are quite simply just banned from the public sphere. That means you can hold these views in private lives. You're just not allowed to put them on social media. You're not allowed to use them in rallies. If you need an analogy for this, think of the way that Germany goes about um, post-Nazi uh, ideology, for example. You're not allowed to use the swastika in public debates, but like people People are still able to hold neo-Nazi ideologies in Germany. I think that model is pretty simple. If there are clarifications on it, I'll take them back. No? Okay. Social cohesion. What I think Op is likely to say here is that uh, former supporters of the dictator are tired because they probably exist insofar as there was a conflict and both sides probably had supporters. Those supporters get pissed off. Why do I think this is unlikely or doesn't matter? One. Per the model, they still have their private lives views. It's not like they're being told that they cannot have the, these views at all. Therefore, the attack from the state is relatively minimal. You're able to rationalize this as an individual who supported these, uh, these dictators. Secondly, um, you've already lost, which, mean, which is important to point out then. I think the likelihood that these former supporters of the dictator are likely to erupt into some form of violence, are likely to erupt in some form of, some form of like democratic destabilization, is incredibly unlikely because at the point where they've already lost, what is the tipping point of then just banning their symbols in the public sphere? They probably already have some propensity to violence to some degree, so I don't know what the delta of the emotion is. But thirdly, I think they have likely just consented to this trade-off and having this form of restriction placed on them to some degree, insofar as that they knew this was coming when the dictatorship fell, and insofar as they are just like hardliners to the dictatorship and whatever ideology that dictatorship had, they best serve that by keeping their mouth shut and not getting themselves put in prison or killed by publicly putting out these uh, uh, ideas. So I think the likelihood of these people erupting into violence as a result of the policy is incredibly unlikely. Why is there a tipping point though in favour of social cohesion on our side? Two main reasons. Firstly, supporters of the new government need a symbol. Insofar as the people who have been part of this democracy movement are inherently distrustful of the state because that previous state has constantly beaten them down with a stick and not allowed to arise. If you say, we're actually going to allow the people who beat you with a stick to keep waving that stick in the public sphere. That is, makes it incredibly unlikely for them to engage with the new democracy. That makes them incredibly unlikely to vote, incredibly unlikely to support new public services. They need that new state to make an active step towards them to say, no, no, the state is new, the society is new, and you're welcome and able to function here. But secondly, I think that newer generations only hear one side as you go former, which means that on their side, the debate between the dictator and the new democracy is seen as legitimate because there are both sides. On our side, newer generations, 20, 30, 40 years down the line, have only ever heard the dictator was bad, the democracy is good, and that makes them incredibly unlikely to be part of not just a democracy-supporting movement, but just a society where everyone holds the same fundamental view and at least has that unifier which prevents like, the breakouts of further in-groups and out-groups later. Well, Why does this matter? It matters because it means you get more buy-in to the state. It means more access to public services. It means better quality of life, um, etc. And it reduces the propensity of intergroup violence and a re-eruption of conflict going forward. Uh, I'll take the first POI from closing.
uh, after Chile's transition to democracy, Pinochet was still the head of the military. How do you think you would have thought about this policy? A uh, cool example of assertion. One, I think in most democracy, I think in most post-conflict states, see Libya, see others, and uh, the dictator ends up dead because people hated them. I think this is a minority example. You have to prove why this is the majority example, and therefore the judges should care about this example to any degree. Secondly, preventing. Uh, actually, before this, I'll take the second PR from opening if they have it now. Okay. Sure, I have to stay too. <laughs> yeah. uh, so what do you think if brutal dictator Cyrus the Great actually was a pretty good person? Uh, again, I don't care. Insofar as they were a dictator and therefore they probably limited some form of free speech, some form of democracy, some form of free agency, that is still a net bad. I, I, like, I don't, uh, insofar as we are proving to you, you, you get a good, at the very least then this becomes a wash if you can pr prove that the majority of dictators were somehow good. Again, prove your example as the majority instance. Preventing backsliding. Look, I know there are a couple of reasons here why so we prevent backsliding into weaker forms of democracy or outright dictatorship. One, part of the previous analysis, we are basically indoctrinating a new generation into democracy is good by preventing them from having any access to information that says dictatorship, good. That means that they are very unlikely to ever think that dictatorship is good. Secondly, we allow debate to move on because insofar as you're not rehashing the debates of the past, i.e. was the dictator bad, that creates space and time in the public sphere for people to move on to new debates on what do we do with healthcare, what do we do with education, etc. That normalizes a degree of rational, normal, democratic debate by by moving the country on, that means that that's likely to embed itself. Thirdly, we are re-indoctrinated to some degree because insofar as most di dictators see the Soviet dictators, see Nazi Germany, etc., do indoctrination of their public to keep them on site, I think if we get rid of them and re-indoctrinate them in a new way which says democracy is good, that is just likely to be successful. But fourthly, I think the state is more likely to be functional insofar as people are more likely to invest here because investors value stability. Democracies are more likely to be stable if we prove that they can be stable. I think the impact is that more democracy is more likely to bed in or more likely to prevent future uh, atrocities, get people greater agency. The trade-off here then is Op says that this limits democracy by restricting speech. Here's why I don't care. Free speech is universal, but we do ban it in certain instances where it does active harm or where it limits others' speech by intimidation. It is unjust for other people to limit rights. Only the state can do that because they are accountable and they are consented into the social contract. Insofar as allowing this speech actively harms people who were harmed under dictatorship, it is entirely legitimate to do this. For all those reasons, proposed. We like to thank the Prime Minister for that speech. We now invite the Leader of Opposition to open the advocacy of the Opposition Bench here. here. burden that OG set up very clearly in our counterprop. What we're going to ban is anything that incites explicit violence or as opening governments say, active harm against individuals by talking about this dictator. Not just talking about them in a sympathetic light, but actively talking about them in a way that incites harm or causes violence. Note that this is often overlapped with other legal precedents and laws that ban you from talking about things that, in that enact violence against other people. So for those reasons, these are the kind of, thing, kind of things that we are banning. Given that, I'm going to do four things in this speech. First, just characterize what the suppression of this information is going to look like, then respond to, to respond OG's arguments and give my own arguments. Firstly, what does the suppression of information look like? Because honestly, the model from OG is very unclear and incredibly vague. It's not just about symbols, and especially when, that, when you have to talk about information as well. No, that, might, that maybe Germany has the capacity to limit symbols, or has the capacity to do things like prevent you from talking about like neo-Nazi parties in a good way, but often incredibly well, fragile democracies, no thank you, especially democracies that have been set up by old colonial powers, 
So think about the civil service in India that is literally set up by the British government. Think about countries like Zimbabwe or countries like Yemen, which are coming out of civil wars. These are countries that do not have the capacity to limit the like, symbols and the, the free rights and the information that you talk about in the way OG wants you to do it. In a fragile, weakling democracy, you're likely to turn to things like violence. Because what happens at a rally when you're doing symbols, when you have symbols of your dictator up? It's not like the government is going to post say, you know, like create a law mandating that, oh, symbols are no longer banned at rallies. That's not going to stop anyone in a country that has just come out of a civil war. What happens in these countries is that when you go to a rally and you're holding up these symbols, that's when the government comes in and hoses you down or prevents the rally from even happening in the first place. Given nothing from opening government as to why explicit people going out onto the streets and talking about these dictators, well, they have no solvency for that. We would posit that the, the, the method that governments turn to is violence, especially if they've come out of a post-conflict society. So so often the suppression of information is going to be violent given that open, opening government don't do anything to respond to the idea of people just coming out onto the streets and debating. I'll take close there. So how do you define and enforce explicit harm? Like if I say Stalin is so great, let's return to the era of Stalin. Will you ban me from speaking out on your side? Okay, so if a politician said let's return to the era of Stalin and they had to talk about the, for example, all of the camps that Stalin had to do in order to like, harm people, then obviously just saying that you support Stalin wouldn't be banned by talking about all the explicit policies that Stalin had to do would probably be banned. I think the idea of active harm and free speech is something that's actively contested in modern society nowadays, but honestly the line of active harm and explicit violence is probably a more clear-cut line than the idea of sympathy towards the dictator, right? So if we're talking about which line is more clear-cut, then obviously the the opposition line of active harm and inciting violence is clear and the idea of being sympathetic, which is probably that people are going to understand for a far less of a degree. So what if we're talking about how it's going to be interpreted, then obviously it's a win for opposition. No, thank you. Responding to opening options argument, I just want to respond to this one very feeble idea. Is that young people, is, and when they get older, will never hear about why the dictator was good and as a result they're going to bind to democracy. They themselves say that you can talk about the dictator privately and we posit in opposition that oftentimes this dictator has huge amounts of support even though he has been overturned. So given that you can talk about them privately, it's unclear to me why young people never hear about why this dictator was a good thing. Rather, young people wonder as to why mainstream politics, mainstream government aren't the ones who are talking about this dictator in a good light or are talking about the pros and cons of this dictator. They wonder because everyone in private is talking about this dictator, but no one in the mainstream is talking about them. Given that, argument one on why tensions get worse, no thank you. We posit that censorship fuels and anti-establishment narratives and populist narratives in, the so in society. What we want is we want these individuals with these narratives who support this politician to interact with mainstream media, to interact with mainstream politics, to interact with any mainstream political system. Why is it necessary that these people inter interact with mainstream politics? I would posit a few reasons. One, because a huge, sizable group of individuals who even after the conflict support these dictators, support these leaders, and often because there was a conflict by, by virtue of this, people probably support the tyrannical dictator that, 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 that resulted. What happens, no thank you, when you can't talk about this dictator in a positive light? They often disconnect and disestablishment, like disconnect from the mainstream themselves. What they do is they turn to things like echo chambers, or they just don't interact with mainstream politics, they don't vote, they don't engage with democratic systems, they don't go to institutions that are involved with democracy, but rather go back to the very institutions as tyrannical dictator that they themselves set up. The issue is that when these group of people don't interact with democracy, that leads to the exact backsliding that opening government doesn't want to happen. Because when they're not engaging with democracy, when they're not going out to vote, when they're not talking with politicians or like even discussing or thinking about mainstream politics, that's when democracy gets, gets worse. The second is that these people turn to more anti-democratic forms of rallying, of protest, of discourse. What does this look like? It means they turn to things like violence. They turn to things like convincing people in ways that the tyrannical dictator they themselves did. Because when you can no longer engage with mainstream media, when your party that somewhat like sympathizes with the dictator before gets banned and is not allowed to run in elections and is not allowed to do other things, and they turn to other forms of collectivizing. They turn, especially if it's a fragile democracy, they turn to the very bad conflicts 
that these tyrannical dictators they themselves set up. I'll take that POI. Yeah, okay, so look, we preempt all of this by pointing out the point where they're out of power, out of the majority, uh, they are also already incredibly pissed off. What the hell is the tipping point here? Okay, when they're out of power and out of the majority, they can still engage and feel as though they can interact with the institutions and get themselves back into power, right? So they still have the opportunity to win an election and come back into power if they want. But in your world, when they can no longer win an election because they can't even appear on the ballot, that is when they turn to violence and other forms of tyranny. Second argument is on the principle. We would posit that the threshold to banning active forms of speech is when they cause active harm. And often, Talking about the dictator in a sympath sympathetic light is not enough to actively cause harm or incite harm against other individuals. Why? Because talking about someone in a good light doesn't mean that you condone all of their actions, right? You don't condone everything that they've done. You don't condone, for example, all of Stalin's actions because you can still think, for example, as many people in Russia, Russia do, that Stalin was a good leader, but a lot of his policies were bad. So talking about, talking about someone in a sympathetic light is not enough of a justification to cause active harm. But rather, we posit that democrat democracy is about talking about people's views, and especially if their the OG characterization is that all of these countries are democracies, are, albeit fragile, then we would uphold that and prevent the backsliding because now people can talk about the dictator in a sympathetic light. They can talk about the pros and cons. They can engage in mainstream politics that fulfills the burden of democracy far better than opening government can. For those reasons, incredibly proud to oppose. We like to thank the Leader of Opposition for that speech. We invite the Deputy Prime Minister to continue the case for opening government interview. and say they would only ban stuff which has, uh, explicitly incites violence and says this is much more clear cut, I think this is actually the opposite. I think it is very difficult to tell where this line is. If I say I like the Nazis, that doesn't mean I explicitly said I think we should all rise up and overthrow the democratically elected government. However, the implications and the undertones there are obviously that, oh, I think the current government is bad and that I endorse this other view which incites violence and extreme ideologies then. I think this is much more difficult and less clear cut, which so if they want to say that suppression is going to lead to violence and means that the government who is doing this and enforcing this suppression is going to be more violent on our side, I think it is more likely to be violent on their side because they are more likely to make accidental inferences and therefore shut down everyone in any capacity at all. Cool. Direct responses to opening opposition, then going on to the continuation of the principal Alexander Brock because I also think it clashes quite nicely with the stuff that they have. Cool. First of all, I think they say that a lot of these countries don't have the capacity to do stuff and attack the men. I think it is actually very clear what Alexander brings out. I think you're able to suppress information about like how people can be sympathetic and things through this through like education and education systems and things like this. Because even if your government is poor or this country doesn't have like a lot of financial capital, you still have to run things like education systems. And so you decide the curriculum within that curriculum. You simply just do not ever present or like give room to debate the sympathies or maybe the good sides that the past government ever had. I think in things like museums, which are often state held, you just get rid of anything that might allude to them having a good side or favorable aspects, things like that. But I also just want to make something very clear. I think controlling the internet is incredibly easy. Even if you're a very poor country, I think you're able to just censor words quite explicitly and easily. Like you can just control F the internet or get other, like, you know, you're probably friends with people who control the media and things like this. You can just ban websites, you can ban access to this information online. I think it is actually very easy to do so, even if you're a poor country. Lots right. of places do this very easily, even though they are very poor. I think that um, they say that they say explicit harm is far more clear cut, which I just think is obviously not the case because the implications of symbols and things like this is um, is not always the case. Because I think what I want to say is that I think a dicta dictator uh, or a tyrannical government is often a symbol. It doesn't matter if they have one good policy. Maybe like their economic policy was actually very sound and had a lot of good basis. They represent an ideology which, in general, is harmful. Right? The nuance between different policies that a government or a dictator has does not exist and it 
cannot exist because only the most extreme views and the worst things they have ever done are the things that people remember. So, you know, if you were to stand and went like, oh, Hitler actually had a really good program for really poor people and workers' rights in the 1930s, no one's going to think that's a good thing, though, because you still should endorse that if he's committed war crimes and genocide. I don't think that nuance should be allowed to exist more in the principle later. I think that then they said, um, I think that on tensions they say, oh, they get worse. I think this is not the case because they say, oh, people then don't engage in democracy and this is a bad thing. I think this is much better. They say people fall into echo chambers. They don't exist on their side because we have banned echo chambers where people can do this. When there's only one side of the story presented saying that this dictator was a bad person, you can only engage this. I think actually echo chambers get much worse when you can choose which information to consume. When you can choose to consume information which says the past dictator was maybe an okay person, that's what you choose to do because you're sympathetic to the site. When that no longer exists, you're less likely to do that. But even if some small websites exist where you can discuss this with fellow people who say, oh yeah, the past regime was much better. This is a very, very small minority of people now. Whereas on their side, the scale of the people who can engage in this is much larger. I think this is a much better thing because I think what ha the way that like uh, toxic ideologies are able to be pushed forward within society is because people are publicly unashamed to hold those views. Like when people say, you know, explicitly racist things in countries now, it is because that people are saying those on mainstream TV. It is the reason that Trump was able to incite so much violence and racism and things like that. Was, and then the fact that his support and uh, support for him and his ideologies had decreased because um, t he's being banned from social media platforms and things like this. Because it is now seen as shameful to see that ideology because it is no longer in the mainstream. So even if some people can engage in it, it is on a very small scale. I'll take a point in closing. Uh, your bar for censoring speech is particularly low when it is in sympathy. So what says that you have not just given a new government the tools to expand the censoring of free speech in other areas of life, which is obviously a regrettable fact? Wait, sorry, say the last part again. This uh, sympathy. The government is likely to censor other people, and that sucks and contradicts your principle. Okay, I actually don't think it is likely to do this because I think when you're you're able to con you're able to um, criticize past governments for very specific reasons, and I'm going to get onto that now. Actually, yeah, this is the principle continued. Cool. What Alexander started was is that, that I think this is actually principally legitimate because it is in line with free speech. The line that we draw with free speech is that if it intimidates or threatens the characteristics of another individual, then you're no longer like free to say that. For example, something like slurs. I think the past leader was as bad because of the stuff that I've already described. That it is a symbol of these bad ideology. So even if they have one or two good things, they you can't, but the nuance does not exist, so they stand for the most racist or the most um, xenophobic ideas that they have. I think then the, the, they stand for things like the oppression of ethnic, religious, or political groups. For example, you can't just say like, oh, maybe Hitler had a good uh, like workers' rights or whatever because he had bad things. So it comes like even if it comes at a cost, uh, even if they've done good things, but it comes at the cost and the detriment to another. Um, group, I think that means that it is not legitimate to talk about that or make it good because they literally committed either war crimes or uh, yeah, uh, broken human rights and things like that. I think the past person was very likely to be bad for three reasons, but before that I will take a point from opening. If it's so easy to control the media and the information, then why do the Arab Springs happen? Uh, maybe, I think because a lot of this was like underground stuff and because a lot of the stuff wasn't expected to the same extent. But I think when you're like in a post-conflict state and you know you have people who support that, you're going to be looking out explicitly for resurrections and ideologies like that um, springing up. But the past person was very likely to be an evil person and have broken war crimes for three things. One, they suppress the majority of people. If you win in a conflict, you must have had the majority of people because you need manpower. Second of all, I think if you're, this is so bad that you risk your life and your family's life, it is because they were, you know, literally going to kill you anyway. So it's not because they just did some dodgy economic policy or whatever. I think third of all, that often the way that tyrannical or dictatorships come into power is because they scapegoat a bunch of people, which makes them look strong. Therefore, they were likely, like, infringing on people's rights extensively. I think, therefore, a government has a duty to protect all people and all members of society. Given that any symbols of this person which might look sympathetic is that an infringement of somebody else's identity and their safety, you have the absolute power and legitimacy to do this in free speech. I think that it is also legitimate for, to some extent for governments to engage in some propaganda. Like even places like the UK or the US, official websites, they don't explicitly lie, but they do present statistics to skew their credibility and uh, like, it makes their ability to look better because it makes them people buy into the government. So I think it is fine, because I think you are able to do this only when it has been a bad person. So your past government, you're able to criticize them. Like, official go uh, government, like, uh, government policies criticize the past governments all the time, even with that stuff. So, why do we win? I think on winning, we win on reversibility, because on their side, I think you're much more likely to get into backsliding. Even if we do prohibit free speech to some extent, I think the social cohesion means that you're, that has been changed, means you're much more likely to progress further into democracy. Um, so for all these reasons, opening our right.
We like to thank the speaker for that speech. We now invite the deputy leader of opposition to close the top half of this debate period. Is everyone ready? <coughs> On both sides of this debate, the governments that we are talking about have to make a really terrible choice. Because either way, one group or another is going to be upset about the decision you make. I.e., if you censor, there will be certain groups who sympathize with the former regime who are going to be, feel affronted. By contrast, if you don't censor, the groups who were hurt by the prior leaders are going to feel affronted. The question then becomes, what do we optimize for? I'm going to begin this speech with a high-level observation about when this censorship and suppression is likely to happen. Because what I want to point out is that there are two different points this could happen. Either this happens in direct agreements and negotiations as you are actively talking about what the new regime will look like, i.e. truth and reconciliation commissions or pacts that you are making between the old guard and the new guard. And the reason that matters is because that affects the way these negotiations are likely to play out. Or secondarily, it happens afterward, i.e. you've already agreed, we are going to coexist, you're going to become less extreme and integrate yourself into the political sphere, and then you are likely going to suppress this speech. Both instances are problematic. First, let's look at what happens in these processes, i.e. when you are having direct negotiations, truth and reconciliation processes that happened in places like South Africa or Greece. In those instances, it is likely that you do not get buy-in to these particular negotiations. Why? Because you are telling the other group, a priori, we will suppress speech that is sympathetic to your side. But the premise of your negotiations that you're having right now is, let's hear you out, oh, let's talk out and hash out, no, I'll take you later, don't badger, Let's talk out and hash out what exactly we're going to do in this new regime. I.e., we understand to some extent that you had concerns that were happening in the old regime. You're mostly wrong, but you still should have a space in which you could talk about your prior beliefs so that we can correct them later down the line. In those instances, people are less likely to come to the negotiating table in the very first place in as much as you are telling them that they can't talk about their prior views. You are telling them that they should be shut out entirely from the political system. Or it is the case that you do this post facto, and that matters because the premise of OG is people are forgetting about the conflict. But this is likely going to be wildly controversial. Certain people who felt very strongly during this prior period, i.e. during the old guard when they sympathized with this particular dictator, are likely to be upset. So this ruins the foundation of your new state. What does this do to the debate? One, it amplifies all of Rohan's arguments about why it is the case that tensions get significantly worse. But secondly, it is prior to OG, because all of OG is premised on question. We've already made this agreement, and now we are going to ban the speech. People aren't upset anymore. We question that premise and explain why, and as much as people are less likely to come to the negotiating table in the first place, the premise of all of their arguments just does not work. OG. Okay, but I'm not clear on the comparative here, because the analogy for your engaging in democratic discourse uh, uh, argument is climate change deniers getting equal time in US media. All that's done is normalize illegitimate views and slow down social progress. That's why we're willing to make the trade-off of a little imperfect democracy in Sure, sure. So in my second class, I'm going to explain why on the comparative we're actually able to moderate misinformation. On tensions, OG has several mechanisms that they say for how it is that they alleviate tensions. Their first is that this is just symbols, so it isn't going to be that bad. Number one, even if this is true, clearly these symbols are important to particular people. People are going to feel affronted, as I point out. But number two, if it is just a symbol, that seems to magnify our harms and minimize their benefits, because then all of the other speech that you're engaging in is still allowed on their side of the house. So this just narrows the debate and doesn't really help them all that much. Their next mechanism is that the other side has already lost, and therefore they are likely to accept the fact that you are making this particular suppression, i.e. they don't feel as connected to the prior dictator. Several responses. One, per our framing, we're still highly sympathetic to these particular groups, and this is likely to happen when these agreements are happening, i.e. truth and reconciliation commissions or pacts, so this is unlikely. 
Two, even if you feel some degree of conflict fatigue, there's a sense of unfairness because the other side is still able to express sympathy toward their particular group that was also engaged in the conflict, and in as much as that is true, it's likely that this is going to be seen as anti-democratic. So even if you were beginning to be okay with the new regime and beginning to forget about your nostalgia, this is likely to reignite that sense of unfairness. Thirdly, populist parties are likely to drum up anger about this particular policy, i.e. they will tell people that this is unfair. They will tell people that this is railing against democratic institutions, even if they can't explicitly also express sympathy for that past regime. Finally, they say, ah, but you're already out of power, so this doesn't matter. But notably, people still have strong connections to these prior leaders because your family might have been connected to them. You have a sense of nostalgia, and it was likely highly recent in as much as these post-conflict societies are like sort of have stuff ongoing. There might be conflict that re-emerged later down the line. So therefore, their arguments about why you're getting over it just are not true. Why does this matter? Because their argument about why this is a tipping point for people who are younger, forgetting about past conflicts, is flipped. If anything, because this ignites so much controversy, it is actually on our side of the house where we don't create this degree of controversy and sense of unfairness that it is the case that we actually get people to accept and move forward in the regime. Uh, so, the next thing they say is that they prevent backsliding. What I want to note is that all their mechanisms under their third argument about how they prevent backsliding are all contingent on their first argument, i.e. people are likely going to forget about the things that happened in the past regime. And as much as I beat those mechanisms, their next argument does not function. Finally, the DPM says in response to Rohan, ah, we can ban echo chambers too. I want to point out what this does to the debate, because in as much as they concede this, that enlarges our margin, i.e. the more you suppress, the more people get angry, and therefore, the more it is the case that people rise up and agitate CG quickly. Okay, so just to be clear, Matt just told you that there are also some people who will be angry on their side. Why would they not? I will do the way. I will do the way. So, secondly, this creates a precedent, because now there's a perception that other people within the new regime will be further censored, and governments are likely to weaponize this to censor other things that they deem to be marginally sympathetic, and this is likely to be the case in as much as people also have high degrees of resentment toward the prior party. That is an additional reason that you create tensions. Why is leaving this speech out in the open better? One, because now we can moderate information. When we have more set, like measured and sensible discussions about the actual atrocities that happened, we can have discussions in academia about why it was actually the case that these particular harms happened. And notably, this creates a chilling effect on their side because now academics are scared of even discussing these issues in the first place if they feel that they're being priori censored. But also, there's a lot of misinformation from the other side. On our side, we get a race to the media where both sides can hash out their concerns per their own mechanism that people are starting to move on. Whereas, if there's a sense of unfairness, you don't get that measured discussion that happens within academia because people feel deeply, deeply wrong. So, let's do the way. Both sides, people are going to be upset. The reason we should minimize the anger of the people who sympathize with the dictator is because they're likely to be more prone to violence. So even if they're numerically smaller, there's a greater risk to democracy. We should let people move forward appropriately and be heard out in a way that is measured and does not censor their beliefs. Very proud to oppose. We'd like to thank the deputy speaker for that speech. We invite the member of government to open up the back half of this debate. Here, here. Um, yeah, can I order a bonus time? Yes. Now I'm bonus time. Okay. Much like always, I'll take at least one POI, but since I'm required to take two, um, I will take three. Because, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, so at least one from O, and at least two from CO because they're funny. <laughs> so, uh, starting with speech in three, two, oh, sorry, three, two, one. When a mortar shell blows up the walls in your house and you can no longer have basic shelter, something's really important to understand. Do you want another war or do you want to live in peace? Do you want to be able to cook your food, go to your job, and just live as someone who wants to have a basic common sense life? What closing government tells you is very simple. We will first of all tell you what the normal person on the ground, the median individual who is relevant, wants in this debate. And we will weigh this against the claims that both top half teams have given you, which means we'll actually let you judge the debate instead of giving you a mess of notes. This will probably be good for panel B.
Now, second of all, I will explain to you why they will win elections on their side. Specifically, why will authoritarians gain support on their side to the point where it causes conflict? But more importantly, I'll explain to you why even if Kat and David are correct and we have the possibility of becoming dictatorships on side government, the government will become better on our side. And then I'll defend why the government won't do the insane things that Mariela was talking about. First of all, let's talk about who these people are and what they want. One thing you can see is that I think opening government really does strongly underestimate what opening opposition says. These societies are riven apart with households fighting each other, neighbors knowing that someone else was part of a war that killed their relatives. Of course they're on edge, and of course they're stressed. At that point, the two questions remaining on opening government are how do you suppress speech, which is not on the internet, and if you do end up suppressing that speech, why would that lead to a lack of conflict? Well, there's two very important clarifications here. The first one is that often, even though a huge amount of people might believe that the past state was legitimate, the thing that is most frequently, consistently most important to these people is the conflict itself, that they lost lives, they lost businesses, they lost revenue. As a result, even though a lot of people are ideologically driven for argue for their rights, the second when that arguing involves fighting someone physically or having to be involved in the same thing that destroyed their businesses in the past, they back out of it. That's why often a lot of people in democratic regimes will argue for things which they believe in, but there will be very few revolutions even if every commie student in the US thinks that they want Marxism back. As a result, often they're unlikely to go into a violent conflict, but they do want to speak out about their opinions. Okay, so why exactly do the vast majority of people in the middle not give a shit? First of all, their stability and basic needs only become legitimate if other people aren't arguing around them. Because if that argument inflames into the sense of instability, where someone gets into a fight, someone throws a Molotov cocktail, someone decides to go back to Ireland, as a result, probably your businesses no longer function very well. Why? So, as a result, the main issue then is that when the government comes in and arrests people, when they speak about the past regime, when as a result, people who are extreme fight the government back, what happens is that the person supporting the past regime is a troublemaker. It's that motherfucker who's the reason I can't sell cupcakes anymore because now the government has come and started fighting my neighbor. As a result, this does two things to the debate. First of all, this shows on-site opposition why their claim, which is that if you suppress speech, violence will occur, is less likely. Because if you have a higher barrier to being involved in this conflict, it is significantly more difficult to join in. When you're risking your own physical life and your own social life, as well as the stability of your community. But second, this amplifies the mechanism. Because if many people in that community will stress you and pressure you to not get into that conflict, it's not just if the 10 to 20% who are extreme don't want this anymore. It's the 20 to 30% in the middle who no longer want you to do anything because it causes a conflict. Now, of course the response from government is quite simple, which is, why wouldn't there be violence on our side as well? Why wouldn't these mechanisms be comparative? Very simple, because opening opposition has thankfully modeled something that beats them in this debate. Because if their claim is that you will start to suppress people when they are violent, then it doesn't matter if people don't want violence. The concern is that if you suppress someone who's pro-Stalin, and at that point, people believe that someone who's anti-Stalin should also be suppressed, you have an incentive to instigate violence. In other words, a lot of people in India, for example, when someone says something offensive to what they believe is their Hindu faith, will go out and physically fight people so that when the violence increases, the government wants to shut down the speech to avoid instability. At what? that point, before that quickly, oh, oh. Even if the barrier to you speaking is higher and there's a threat of you being arrested, because you're sympathetic, your perception is still that you're being deeply, deeply wronged. So therefore, the children still feel angry and support the new populist parties flipping your face. Wait, but you're in jail. Isn't that also a deep wrong that you affects like your entire family? Isn't that a wrong that other people will tell you is less important than the fact that you're going to jail? Isn't that a wrong that you've suffered for so many years that you're fucking tired of it? And if you want to go back into the conflict, if you're not going to make any significant change because you just lost the war, you just give up and try to make your bloody cupcakes, dude. Closing opposition, quickly. Your mechanism works in a school classroom where everyone hates the nerd who keeps putting their hand but in the real world, people lay down their lives to fight for their democratic freedoms. Yeah, but would you want your son to lay down their lives so that everyone in your family also has to lay down their lives? I mean, I don't know what kind of conflict classrooms you've been in, but generally, the reason people stress you to not be someone who stands up, the reason why troublemakers are frustrating, is because they harm the entire community to the point where they cannot function. So, on opening opposition and closing opposition, there will be increased sense of violence. What will this look like? First, Matt says this will piss off someone. Okay, well, someone will probably be angry enough to go through a Molotov cocktail. 
the result of this is that every time a statement is made that you do not like, or a politician continues to push a narrative that you do not like, you incite violence because the state now has a prerogative to shut them down to maintain stability because that is the legitimacy that OO provides you. But as a result, first, no thank you, there'll be a lot more apathy in the political system because people don't want to be involved in politics, but it's so much more conflicting, so much more angry, and so much more frustrating. While on our side, often people will just say, just fucking forget it. We've had enough wars, we want to live with our lives, so they will probably do things like say ask for simple basic things which Alex tried to mechanize but didn't and like for example health policy, education, concerns about your jobs and as a result the political system gets better but second of all often on their side you can hearken back to an old past the grass used to be greener, the Stalinists used to support us, Yugoslavia was stable on our side that is taken out of that context and that no longer looks like a possible alternative at all because of the legal repercussions and the societal ones so the election system gets better. Finally some responsive material to opposition's claim that our government will get worse. The first response is that if we are correct in that violence increases, then presumably our government gets worse on their side because when you have to crack down on these people with guns and bombs and grenades, that makes you a lot more angry and evil. You end up becoming someone who solves problems through physical violence, like Ahmed, as opposed to someone who talks it out, like me. Second of all, it's probably also true that the state wants to make people come together on our side so they won't be heavy-handed with this. The first reason is, if there's other parties who will blame you, as Moriello says, how do you maintain the like very fragile majority you just got for that post-conflict state? You probably want your coalition to stay strong because you know there's people on the streets ready to take you down. But second of all, you just formed a nation by telling everyone we're going to give you a better life. That's a pretty big obligation you have to fulfill. So you have to make sure people on the ground like minorities are respected which is why the Indian constitution has like 15 different clauses about how discrimination is bad. On that, don't be armored, be sure you're closing down. I would like to thank the member of government for that speech. We invite the member of opposition to extend the case for the opposition bench here. Thank you. I think the rest of this debate is extremely idealistic about what post-conflict societies look like and how the governments that have to deal with the rubble and the aftermath have to rebuild their societies. It's not a case of, as opening suggests, that you can just come in with revolutionary new policies and reform a new government. And it's definitely not the conception CG says, we can just have a new government and everyone can just shut up and move on because this new government's gonna be la 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 and great. The new regime has to deal with a broken country that has just gone through conflict and they cannot immediately just conduct revolutionary reform. They need to use things like old infrastructure, they need to restore continuity and stability, and they often need to use old experts and old policies that were historically successful. And if you look at the empirical reality of most successful post-conflict societies, they did not do this policy for the reason that they always needed an ideological backdoor to go back on some of those old policies. It looks like, for example, in Chile that we offered in a POI, when Pinochet had, you know, <coughs> neoliberal policies that adopted free trade policies in Chile. It looks like the continuation of Meiji policies that subsidized old family conglomerates. It looks like Deng Xiaoping's capitalist reforms that went against state ideology, but were able to foster the growth and the stability of the people. All these policies would not have been po possible under their side, because their side drives their people and their government into such an ideological corner that they're unable to discuss the new of past policies and past ideas and governments that could have been effective. We deliver that nuance and that is why we win this debate. So, our primary extension is on why their side gets worse policies because they're unable to be nuanced in the discussion of policy making and governments. The simple premise to establish here is that these past regimes, yes on net they were bad, yes on net they were dictators and we as reasonable people do not like dictators, but there's a reason why they were able to govern for such a long time. And that is because they were able to adopt a set of policies or have very, you know, good technocratic experts who are game at their job. They were able to keep the gears of this clock running for an extremely long time. They were able to establish infrastructure. They were able to analyze the, the nature of their people and adopt 
you know, forms of governance that are suitable to the culture or uh, the temperament of that specific society. The active suppression of information and sympathy towards these kinds of regimes actively detriments the continuation or the adoption or the discussion of these policies in three ways. Firstly, it is extremely difficult to employ or use old technocrats and old officers from the past regimes when you are simultaneously, under their side, trying to discredit them and silence them. Because the kinds of stakeholders that are most important, apparently once you remove the kind of neo-Nazis through OO's counterprop, aren't like people that are just like extremely radical in speaking out opposition against the current party. It is policymakers and old officers who have some sympathy towards the policies of past regimes, who could see that maybe capitalism has a place within even a very socialist market. Secondly, it is very difficult to run a campaign or policy platform, even as a democratic government, when you just run a whole ideological narrative that everything that past regime did led to death and suffering, right? It is impossible to galvanize people and get votes in an electorate when you've told everyone that we can't run this policy because these policies in the past were good. And that's the kind of thing that opposition parties will weaponize against you. They'll say that you are failing your own ideological mandate because you are the one that is continuing the past policies of the dictator that everyone hates so much. And if anything, it's not even that you don't adopt these policies, there's often an elasticity effect where these governments adopt the literal opposite policy. And that's really, really bad because if that policy worked historically and you now adopt the literal opposite policy, then Structurally speaking, that policy is the worst policy that you can use on your policy smorgasbord. And lastly, you lose data or information that is useful for policymakers and technocrats. Because if you erase historical information or assessments of the value of these policies, and a lot of the ways that we assess things like economic policies or assess like decisions made by governments, is look at historians and look at, you know, what did the policies of the 70s and 80s do to the economies back then and use that form of reflection. If you cannot undertake that form of reflection anymore, because any simple towards those policies would, by extension, be seen as a sympathy towards that past dictator, then you are unable to engage in that discussion. A quick bit of weighing. Firstly, we prove that if you get more effective government, that's a thing that leads to stability, because only a minority of people, as you know, closing talks about, are zealous and are attached fondly to symbols, but the majority of people, when they don't have food to put on the table, when they feel like their government is ruling ineffectively, they are the ones that are likely to come out on the streets and write and protest and throw coups. But secondly, we actually most specifically and accurately engage with the stakeholder of this debate. Opening cars miss each other because O runs a counter fear of like getting rid of the people who are super extreme. We engage specifically with that stakeholder because it's those technocrats, it's the old officers, those are the ones that are likely to engage in these nuanced discussions that don't just incite violence. If dictators building roads is good, I don't know why future governments also can't build roads without saying Pinochet was also a great guy. I think that your POI is an incredibly unnuanced and uncharitable take of literally the examples I gave in my speech. Obviously building roads is not an ideological direction of policy, like everyone can build roads. It is about the way you build roads. Are you gonna have a mass welfare state where you tax the people? No, you can't do that anymore because you've discredited everyone who's done that to build roads. You just don't get that road on your side, even if the idea of putting concrete on the ground is useful. Closing. If David is right and people care the most about their everyday life, then he proved that that's the reason they rebelled in the past because a dictator fucked over their everyday life. Flipping your claim, you probably shouldn't use their policies and communism probably doesn't work. You run into the problem I explained in my introduction. Just because people recognize a problem and now overthrow the current government does not mean that that new government is perfectly equipped to deal with the kind of obstacles that the past government faced. That is why we explain that they need to use some of the older policies. Even if not all of them, even though the past government on net was bad, you need to use some of those ideologies. Second extension, why do they provide the tools for the current regime to become more authoritative? Uh, the simple reasons that OO only provides in one sentence, firstly, is that they give them the tools to do this. Because in order to have an effective policy on their side, like the web censorship that DEPM talks about, you need to, for example, de establish censorship departments. You need to run things like background checks on government employees. Secondly, you provide the justification for governments to do this because you give them a policy mandate. And thirdly, you provide the security for them to expand this. That looks like, for example, the fact that that speech is very subjective means that you can silence someone and just kind of say, well, they were saying something that, you know, kind of was probably maybe inciting hatred, right? And it also looks like you just have no accountability because the very core structural part of censorship is that you can't keep it accountable because the whole point of censorship is that people won't know it exists in the first place. So you can't have a policy where you're like, we'll censor this, but we'll tell everyone what we censored. That goes against the aims of censorship. as why a censorship is a 
tool that inevitably expands. This is very important. Firstly, it entrenches the power of the incumbent and allows them to silence people democratically. Secondly, it allows the impressive expansion of state power. This is important because it hits a far larger stakeholder than the neo-Nazis that OG talks about. We hit everyone in society, everyone who is now silenced. For these reasons, very proud to oppose. We'd like to thank the member of opposition for that speech. We invite the government whip to close the advocacy at the government bench here. Give me a second. Uh, I'll take two PLIs, probably from O O uh, and one from CO. I'll probably take them back to back. So like, I'll take one answer and then take another one. Uh, probably at around the fourth place. Okay. All right. I'm going to start in three, two, one. The first thing I want to identify is that access to information is symmetric on both sides of the house. This removes the CO extension on having access to how to build roads and better infrastructure, but also the old counterfactual of moderated discussion. Because Matt doesn't actually ever prove what that looks like. So presumably the thing you need for moderated discussion is to know about the statistics of what happened in past communist policies. Just go to the archives, you can get it. The UN probably has it. Your allies probably also has that as well. So insofar as that was the counterfactual op stood for, on both closing op and opening opposition, we're able to have access to that. But two extraneous responses to closing opposition nonetheless. The first is just to say, they don't ever prove why the ex policies of the dictators were good. Because surely think about it logically. Dictator. War. Post conflict state. What happened in the middle? War. The reason why war probably happened was because whatever policy was done in the past was not adequate. So if that is the case, closing opposition loses by their own metric because war just happens far more significantly. Because the same policies that led to massive amounts of ethnic tension and inequality becomes replicated. At that point in time, not only do they lose on skill to all three other teams, because like people just by definition are going to die, but they also don't get what David wants to go for, which is a far better utopia in which you got ideological direction into a better world. So that's probably why you're losing. But second of all, there's an active trade-off. So even if David proves that the old policies of the economies were good, not only does my information stuff at the top bring that out, because you can also have access to information about how to pursue those policies on both sides of the house. But I think it's just worse policies as compared to modern policies you can have, e.g. things, for example, like capitalism, or working with the UN, or working with the IMF. And if that is the case, insofar as it's a trade-off, we're beating closing opposition. Why then is there a trade-off? The first thing I want to point out is that the vast majority of multilateral institutions today, they're often conditionalities that are imposed on specific states. At that point in time, when you don't opt into, for example, the international neoliberal world order, the UN and the US actively do not trade with you. But the second is to say there's a perceptual thing. So a lot of people still live in the Cold War, and at that point in time, they think, ah, communist. Let's stay away. And then they go trade with other individuals. So insofar as you erect those specific types of policies, you lose out on other types of individuals. Why are these other individuals better? Number one, there's far more accountability and checks and balances because there's five or six different multilateral organizations. There's one Pinochet and like maybe Pinochet's best friend. But second of all, also oftentimes the numeracy of that aid is also more significant because there's more allies that are subscribed to those multilateral institutions to get far higher degrees of support. But finally, and this is also significant as well, Oftentimes, the interconnectedness of that policy means that you're able to get individuals to bail you out in instances in which you fail. This is like Cuba, for example, who does not trade with like the IMF and the World Bank, is significantly worse off than a lot of countries that during decolonization opted to the Western states. The issue is there's an active trade-off, so at the point in which they go with communist policies, they're losing this debate, even if you don't mind anything I just said. Why do we be top hat in this debate? No. The first extension Sharia brings you is on buy-in, and this is significant, because even if opening opposition is right on moderating discourse, and mostly proved by the pro-dictator sympathizers that can join in that discourse, we bit this argument by proving why the other individuals who are leaving out by definition are more significant in this debate. Here's the way for this. Three parts. Number one, look, if the sympathizers are going to be pissy, they will be pissy on both sides of the house. Because they will never want to stop at, look, let's allude to this policy being good. They will stop at, let's make this policy explicitly good and go back to Stalinist regime again. At that point, unless Rohan stabs his own counterfactual, a lot of the violence will happen on their side. If anything, Sharia proves that the violence is worse. Because when you let it ferment and let it build up, and don't stop it until the point of instigating the violence, the violence becomes far worse and therefore more minorities die. That's the first point of weighing against opening up. But second of all, no. The amount of people they're talking about is probably incredibly small for a plethora of different reasons. One, most people who are part of the post-conflict elite regime are probably dead by definition of the war. Number two, if they're not dead, they fucked off because they've got exiled or the international community has built them out. Number three, they probably don't want to live in the place in which they're literally shamed because even if they're still well and good and they probably have a lot of money, 
when you walk on the street, people will throw eggs and rocks at you because they don't like you very much. So at that point in time, you've probably moved to another country. So I'm unsure as to why you're that significant in the first place. Matt says, ah, no, but they have guns. Answer, let's take away your guns. <laughs> because that's what we do in international discourse. Anyways, at that point in time, I'm not sure what the individual's opening opposition wants to stand for is that significant in the first instance. But final piece of weight, even if you don't buy any of this, this is the silver bullet we give you in closing government that Kat needs to respond to. The trade-off is, in instances in which you allow these individuals to speak, the common man and the average person is less likely going to have the opportunity to speak. Number one, because every instance in which you're participating in politics reminds them of the past and the forward memories of that dictatorship. But second of all, definitionally, these individuals want to create exclusionary discourse because that is the type of power structure they've been born into. So they're less likely going to want to include these individuals on the ground, which are the people we're going to be able to include. How do you weigh this argument? Number one, there's more people on our side who are part of the discourse, which means more bright minds and therefore more innovative ideas. This mechanizes closing opposition because it proves like there's probably better policies on our side. But second and more importantly, this is really important. Look, if these individuals feel disillusioned with the state, because the state no longer represents them. The state is one by the same institution as 20 years ago. They're more likely going to use violence for all the reasons that leader of opposition said in the first two minutes of his speech. At that point in time, violence is more likely on their side of the house. We're therefore beating them very cleanly. Oh. Allowing baseline speech means the other side comes to the table in the first place and makes pacts which merge them into the political system where they moderate themselves. This beats the premise of all your thoughts to us. No, like, surely they can also moderate on our side of the house, but also I don't think this is about pre-post-conflict state formation because this policy assumes you can have the moderating force. If there's no state because they're still negotiating, then, like, this policy doesn't trigger, so that removes that part of the debate. Right. Closing off. So what you're missing as a government isn't literal statistics on how you build roads. It's the buy-in to establish and continue old policy when you've spent all your capital Okay, uh, two responses. One, I prove why IMF and Western institutions are better, so that beats your claim. But second of all, truly there's some motherfuckers who are oppositions that jump ship and join the revolution, just ask those fuckers instead. Wait, <laughs> why does this weigh against Top Hat? The issue with Top Hat is that the case is really marginal. From opening government, they say, ah, there's more social cohesion, etc. But their own characterization defeats this argument. Because if their characterization is that the youth gradually is going to be more inclined to buy into Western politics, etc. because of social media, I'm not sure why you specifically need this mechanism to trigger the explicit benefit, we prove an explicit harm of violence that better engages with opening up. And the reason why we'd be opening up is because if opening up is correct that these people are so gung-ho about the old regime, this policy doesn't matter, there's no debate, they're just going to try to make the old regime on both sides of the house in this specific sort of way. What though is the second extension and why is that independently winning? Even if you don't buy any of this, the only way for opening up to win this debate is to prove why in moderated discourse, whatever that means because I still don't know, in moderated discourse, the opposition, who is the pro-dictator sympathizer, <coughs> are always going to lose. Because insofar as they do win, you don't get any of their benefits. You just get a spiraling back into violence. And Sharia proves like it's far likely. One, because they have already controlled existing power structures. But two, if you look at the way in which the discourse will play out, there's no way of verifying what people said 20 years ago because all of these infrastructures are torn down. So you can lie about the past regimes. You can say it was great. And compared to the post-conflict state that is today, in which there are rubbles, in which people are starting, it is always going to seem like a rosier picture. So you get far more rolling back into dictatorships and far more violence. That's like closing up takes two first. We like to thank the government whip for that speech. We invite the opposition whip to conclude round one. Period. We get people to shut the fuck up so you can sell cupcakes easier. And if that is an extension, I think Sharia's head is in cloud for several reasons. The first is that this capitalization is probably patently false, in that this sort of discussion often does not occur in the public spaces Sharia talks about, which is to say, often neighbors and those in the same community have very similar perspectives. Because, firstly, policies of segregation means these people are often put into one place, and secondly, you often listen to your family who often tell you what to believe and you largely agree with them. Or thirdly, because the community you interact with and the connections you form often mean you're likely to agree. Which is why the kind of annoying guy who's just like, oh, do you make the past regime wasn't that bad, and yells over your cupcake store doesn't really actually exist on their side, which is why their extension, I think, is premised on a fundamentally unrealistic characterization of how this debate operates. The second thing to note here is that taking them at the best, 
If this assumption is true, that people are like, thank God people can shut up about the past regime now, if that is true, then presumably many people will have a natural incentive not to discuss this thing, right? Which is to say, they probably don't want to litigate the past, they probably are incredibly tired, they don't want to talk about the war, which is why they, broadly speaking, don't want to engage in the kind of problematic discourse that they talk about, which is why it doesn't occur. The important thing to recognise is to say, what worsens, however, is if you seek police into these community, to police the speech of these individuals, and to take away that one guy who has spoken up in a slightly sympathetic way, which is like, maybe Franco's trains were kind of good, and locks them into jail. That's what makes people scared. That's what harms these people, and that's what destroys these communities. And that is the thing you have to reckon with most in Spain, and they're the team which destroys that. Ted goes, you must engage with our trade-off, because we explain, because they apparently explain, the average man is better able to engage in politics. The first thing to note here is, look, the threshold for sympathy is so low, we think it's probably fine just for someone to be like, neoliberal economic policies did markedly, markedly benefit my life, that seems relatively okay. Also secondly, insofar as the entire debate agrees that these voices might be loud or often quite marginal, then presumably you'll find support from other people who are sympathetic towards your perspective, which means people are likely to agree with you, which means people are likely to, yes, maybe this guy's a bit annoying, you can kind of just ignore them. I don't think their harm is particularly manifest, particularly large in this instance, which is why I think CG's extension doesn't get them very far. So then the second thing we're going to do in this speech is explain why our extension wins this debate. David explains that the government under their side get far worse policy. And the nuance which these teams refuse to engage with is obviously dictatorships often do awful things. We can acknowledge that. War crimes are bad. Oppression is harmful. It did indeed hurt people. But sometimes the policies they do might be beneficial in the long run. We explain this looks like Japan's post-war economic policy of continuing to subsidize corporate conglomerates in order to produce more goods, which is what allowed them to recover from the war. We point to things like, yes, Pinochet did lock people up into torture chambers, but the free trade policies did mean that Chile is the most prosperous Latin American country in the world. Some of these policies, okay, like obviously inequality also exists, but they still are the most prosperous on Yes, these forces are good, they decide the ability to do so because David explains it's far more hard to continue these policies when you're criticizing the same people who do these policies in your government. Because none of these teams recognize, yes, it's a post conflict state, but often the technocrats between different regimes do often transfer to each other the values that they are the people with the expertise, they are the people with the knowledge, the people who can actually implement these policies. And Ted goes, well, maybe they're all just dead. I don't think technocrats are fighting wars, so probably they're not dead, which is why precisely they're the ones who are the ones in kind of control of these policies. Now. So then, what do we hear in response? The first response we hear implicitly at DPM is Emma says, well, but these trade off because these dictators committed crimes and they are bad. Well, sure, maybe it did, but we all prioritize the lives of the future population over the lives of past population for the very reason that suffering did exist. It is regrettable, but if this markedly improves the lives of people in the future who have more experiences, we should ensure that their lives have the best capacity to be good. The second thing here is that Sharia asked in the POIs, wise we like, well, these policies are probably quite bad, right? Like, these are just ruined lives, you never prove they're going to be good. There is some nuance to it here. Pinochet oppressed people. Neoliberal economic policies also encourage free trade and for markets to develop. That probably is a good thing. They're not usually inconsistent with each other. And these are policies which are mimicked in other countries as well, which is why you can actually prove that they are quite beneficial in many of these instances. Uh, Thirdly, Ted goes, well, information is symmetric. We can access it too. Yes, maybe you can access the data, but the people who process it, the people who use this information, the people who actually put it into policy and, and actually implement it, unchallenged response. But before that, Okay. As David points out in frame, these states are unstable and have no history of debate. But all arguments rely on dictator sympathizers engaging in a reasoned debate to get policy or prevent backsliding. Insofar as we explain why the emotion prevents backsliding, but I'll never explain why perfectly rational debate can occur, we are winning that trade-off, which also makes out all of CG. No, it doesn't. We're saying that we continue doing the policy. Yes. So the three of these teams think that this is about people talking and scaring the old, like the old guard scaring people by talking, or the new guard cracking down. Our point is take the fight behind the scenes so the rest of the people can actually involve the government and work for their everyday lives. Guys, people can see when you police this man. Like, what are you talking about? You send the police into a local community. Of course you can see that, and that happens in front of people. Absurd claim as well, right? The fourth response we hear here, which I already deal with, is Ted goes, you never actually explain these kind of policies and dictators are good. I will claim that this is an intuition pub, which is said, yes, China is obviously a dictatorship, but they still have significantly good economic growth and uplifting people out of poverty. Obviously, they're not mutually exclusive. The last claim he makes it is that IMF and the US do it better. Once again, not mutually exclusive as well. That is why all the responses have fallen in this debate. Why should you put CO as the first in this debate? Three reasons. Firstly, all three teams litigate this issue of stability for so long. We explain why good 
policy and in some instances this economic policy is a precondition to stability because it is what gets people fed, it is what gives people a shelter. That is why this is a thing you ought prioritise. You cannot get that when your policy is likely to be bad, which is why we satisfy the burden of all three teams of debate. The second thing here is that we have a far more concrete benefit, which is we explain the likelihood of conflict. No one actually says what is the likelihood of it relapsing, what is the likelihood of backsliding. We explain if you criticise these technocrats, you cannot implement the same policy as the past regime, and sometimes they're good and beneficial. The third thing here is just the scale. Everyone focuses on marginal stakeholders, everyone focuses on like the artsy or alt right guy or some guy who holds a shit opinion. We focus on broad society and how we actually help them. That is why CEO has won this debate. The second extension we bring to you is this idea of the surveillance state. Over oh, and one sentence on it, the harm is simple. Firstly, you have less accountability for the new government, and secondly, you also have a chilling effect that people are far less likely to speak out. That is why you all credit this as well. The last thing I'm going to debate is briefly explained by OG and probably also out, which is to say they talk about stability a lot, but they fail to recognize the continuity between these regimes, which is to say, obviously speaking, not everyone is dead. Some people are still going to be around, which is why my POI went to say Pinochet being the head of the Head of the military with a transition to democracy is important for the very reason that often these people are going to be unhappy, they're far more likely to backlash, and these people in, in, who hold the keys to power still are have the capacity to do so as well. Which is why, under their mechanism, I think it's particularly destabilizing, they get far more violence, and that's why things are bad. So, at the end of this debate, what you have to believe here is that we are the only team which markedly improves the lives of people, and that's what you are prioritizing most. We like to thank the opposition whip for that speech. I